Hello guys, so we are going to start a new machine learning algorithm which is called as principal component analysis and uh, we also call it as PCA and uh, we also say it as dimensionality reduction. Now before we go ahead and understand what exactly is PCA, first of all we need to understand why should we use PCA or dimensionality reduction. So for this we really need to understand about a topic which is called as curse of dimensionality. Okay, so curse of dimensionality and in order to make you understand this specific topic let me take some examples over here let's say i have various models okay so let's say this is my machine learning model m1 this is my machine learning model m2 this is my machine learning model m3 this is my machine learning model m4 and I still have some more machine learning models, so be patient, okay, M5, and this is my machine learning model, M6, okay. So let's consider I have this many machine learning models. Now, let's say that I have a data set, and in this specific data set, I have somewhere around 500 features, okay. And whenever we say about dimensionality, this basically means we are talking about something called as dimensions. Now, and whenever I say dimensions, this is nothing but this is features. Okay. So let's say um, this data set that I specifically have is to basically determine or find out the price of the house. Price of the house. So some of the features that I may have in this data set is like uh, house size, right? let's say number of bedrooms or it may be number of bathrooms or it may be uh, I may also have features like number of bathrooms right I may have this many kind of lot of features okay now obviously you know to basically find out the price of the house what is the most important thing you know probably you may need to know the house size you need to know the room size you need to know the number of bedrooms you need to know how many number of washrooms right Let's say for the model M1, I have provided around the most three important features to train out of this entire 500 features. Okay. Let's say after that for the M2 model, I provided somewhere around six features for training the model. Okay. Similarly for the model 3, I have provided around nine features, let's say for training the model M3, right? And uh, after that, for the M4, let's say I have provided 50 features. Okay, or let me just not make it as 50 right now. Let's say that, okay, in this, in this particular case, I have provided probably 15 features. Okay, so let's say over here, I have provided 15 features. And here, now I have increased the number of features. Here, I have provided 50 features for training this particular model. And then probably here I have provided 100 features. And then here I have actually provided 500 complete features. Okay. Now what will happen when I'm providing this many number of features for every model. Okay. Now let's say this model M1, uh, I will be getting some accuracy. Okay. And uh, this accuracy is based on this three specific features. Right. So here let's say this is my accuracy one. So here I am specifically getting accuracy one. Right. Now, after I train my model with these three features and probably train this particular model, I'm going to get accuracy one. Now let's go to the next model where I have specifically used six features and let's consider these six features all are very, very important for determining the price of the house. Then what may happen is that my accuracy two will still increase, right? Uh, when compared to accuracy one. So here I can definitely say accuracy two will be greater than accuracy one. Then let's say M3. Uh, again, when which whichever features we actually provided like this 15 features are still more important when compared to the previous six feature. So I may get an accuracy three, which may be more good at this point of time. Okay. Now let's say when I probably went to model four here. Now you will be able to see that I'm providing 50 features. Now, now in this features, there may be a scenario that some of them may not be at all so much important, right? And some may have more importance, some may have very less importance, some may have no importance at all, right? So now when we will try to find out the accuracy here, you'll be able to find out the accuracy will keep on decreasing when compared to the previous accuracy. Now, what will happen is that 
uh, in this scenario, you will be seeing that this accuracy 3 will be greater than this accuracy 4. Okay. And I'll explain you why this specific thing will probably happen. So let's say this is my accuracy 4. And here you can see that the accuracy 4 has decreased when compared to accuracy 3. Then when I go to the next model where I'm specifically providing 100 features here, the accuracy will still decrease. And then when we go to the next model where I have specifically provided 500 features, and this may include all the features that I have provided in the data set, here you will be able to see the accuracy 6 that you will be getting will still more decrease when compared to the previous accuracy. Now, you may be thinking, right, why this thing is basically happening. This is the reason why we say curse of dimensionality. Now, just imagine, guys, it's just like over here. In model M1, M2 and M3, when we were seeing that after training with, let's say in M3 model, we were training with 15 features, the accuracy was quite increasing over here. And we can consider that this all features were quite important for this particular model to perform well, you know. But when we went to accuracy 4, or when we went to probably this model 4, you know, here we have increased the number of features. Now, this specific model need not require that many number of features to do the prediction. Over here, you can just say that the model is overfeeded, right? The model is overfeeded. So models should be given that many number of features through which the accuracy should keep on increasing. But here you can see that the accuracy is decreasing. Similarly, after this particular step, when we go to the next step, you know, here also you could see that as soon as I provided 100 features and obviously in this features there may be a situation that some of the features may not be at all useful, you know, but still it is model is basically getting trained on that and a lot of confusion actually happens within the uh, model itself. Why? Because see model is altogether uh, inside if you probably say right any machine learning algorithm this, those are nothing but mathematical equations. Now with respect to mathematical equations, you know, as you keep on feeding new and new features, it will try to learn those features also, even though it is not that important, right? So because of that, your model will get overfitted and it will definitely lead to a lot of confusion. And based on that, as the number of features gets increased, your model will start performing, like it will stop performing well, you know? And from that point of time, your model performance will also degrade. Now here, your second point is that your model performance will also degrade. Why? Because as the number of features are increasing, just imagine the number of dimensions are increasing, your model performance will degrade because now the mathematical calculation will happen for that many number of dimensions. So because of that, the model performance will also degrade. Okay. Let me give you a very simple example. Let's say you are a human being. Okay. Let's say uh, there is a person. Uh, I'll just consider there's a person over here. Let's Let's say. And suppose uh, I will just ask this person, okay, what is the cost of a house in this specific location? Okay, in location A, what is the cost of the house? Okay, then the person will probably understand some of the features, okay, which location this is, okay. And let's say he does not have any other location, uh, any, uh, any other features. So this fee location may be my feature one. Now here he may guess that, okay, your probably your house may cost between 450k to 500k. Okay. Now I say that, no, I specifically want a three BHK apartment. Okay. Now I have got a new feature. Okay. Then he may say that, okay, fine. Uh, this was for an average. He, he, he just thought that, okay, this may be an average uh, price for a two BHK apartment. Now, when he says three BHK apartment, then he may say that, okay, now your price may be rising between 600 to uh, 500 to 600 K. Then he suddenly says that I need a house near a beach. Okay. Now this particular parameter is added. Now you know that what will happen, the person will start thinking and this price will keep on increasing. Okay. Then let's say after some point of time, the person demands increases, the other person who wants to buy the house. He says that I want a house near to a celebrity. Okay. Near to a celebrity house. So let's say now this particular feature is also added. Now here again, the price will keep on increasing like this. It will keep on increasing. Now, suddenly the person says, now I also want something like in uh, beside my house, there should be a lot of grocery shops. Now, this particular feature may not be that important to basically increase the price or not. But still, we are adding this particular feature for training our model, right? Now, what will happen? You know, this may create an impact, but it will create a very less impact. Okay, then suddenly you'll be saying that, okay, how many number of schools are there surrounding my uh, surrounding my house? 
then suddenly one more feature will keep on getting added now as soon as we keep on adding this many multiple things this person who is about to say the price right he will also get confused at one point of time right because we are just overfeeding him with multiple features okay i want this i want that i want this so now the person will still get confused and he will not be able to tell you the proper price that basically means the performance of this particular person who is a domain expert in telling you the price range of the houses will decrease and he may also not be able to tell you the accurate result and this is the same thing that is happening when we train our model with many 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 features that is where your curse of dimensionality comes into picture now the question rises how do we prevent it there are two different ways how to uh, remove this curse of dimensionality so two different ways to remove curse of dimensionality one is feature selection now what does feature selection will be saying that we will try to take the most important features and then we'll try to train our model that is what happens in the feature selection the second technique which we are going to discuss in the series is something called as pca and i'll not just write pca i'll just say dimensionality reduction and in this series we are going to focus more on dimensionality reduction and in dimensionality reduction there are again many many algorithms we'll start with pca that is principal component analysis okay so two ways to remove curse of dimensionality one is through feature selection in feature selection what we do is that we try to take the important features and then we train our model whereas in the case of dimensionality reduction what we do we do and this process is basically called as feature extraction okay feature extraction now feature extraction basically says that we'll try to derive a feature from a set of features you know where we will be capturing much essence of the previous feature let's say that i have features like f1 f2 f3 and this is my output what we'll do is that we'll try to derive we'll try to derive a feature like f1 and uh, let's say we'll try to derive a new feature this will be our d1 and d2 from out of these three features and we'll use these features to basically find out our output okay then we'll try to see that how do we derive this particular feature and all everything in short we are extracting this new information so that is the reason we say this as feature extraction super important topic okay so i hope uh, you got an idea about what is curse of dimensionality in brief if i'll tell you that as we keep on increasing the number of features those features uh, at one point of time when we are training those models my model will get confused because i have so many features to learn uh, and because of that the performance of the model will basically degrade and i have also given you an example with respect to a specific person right if you keep on adding features and if you ask this domain expert what may be the price then he may he or she may also get confused with respect to this right so how do we prevent uh, or remove curse of dimensionality uh, there is two techniques one is feature selection and the other technique is something called as feature extraction in feature extraction we are going to learn about the first technique which is called as dimensional reduction and in that we are going to learn about this algorithm which is called as pca okay in short we will be extracting some features from out of the previous feature so this was my original feature and out of this we will be extracting some features like this it may be in lesser dimensions and obviously remember this will be in the lesser dimensions and we'll try to capture the essence out of all these original features the 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 same essence of variance i can also say uh, and then we'll try to derive this particular feature which will be able to perform well when we are training our model so in this section we are going to discuss the differences between feature selection versus feature extraction and this techniques as you all know is used in dimensionality reduction which will actually helps us to reduce the number of features or to extract some important features from the older features that we already have now before we go ahead and understand about this we really need to understand why should we perform dimensionality reduction so here i'm going to note down some important points and this can also be an interview question the foremost reason is to prevent the curse of dimensionality prevent curse of dimensionality so that is the reason why we specifically use dimensionality reduction coming to the second point coming to the second point over here is that to improve the performance of the model to improve the performance of the model now just imagine guys in your data set 
if you have 100 features that basically means 100 dimensions are there obviously to train the model right because in every model when the training happens some mathematical equation is already present over there right so those mathematical equation gets applied to all the 100 dimensions right so because of that it may take more time for training of the model so basically to improve the performance of the model we can also use dimensionality reduction the last point that we are going to discuss is super super important to visualize the data and at the end of the day once we are able to visualize we will also be able to understand the data now you may be thinking what exactly this is guys we human being you know we can at the max we can see in a three dimension way we can visualize anything in three dimension right that is in 3d you can also visualize in 2d right we cannot visualize 4d or any dimension that are higher than 3d right suppose if in my data set i have 100 dimensions obviously i cannot visualize this so in order to understand this data what i can do i can reduce the number of dimensions to 3d or 2d and i can also see this particular information clearly in front of my eyes so that we will be able to understand the data right so if in any interview question if someone asks you why do you specifically use dimensionality reduction you should definitely talk about these three points one is course of dimensionality which i have already explained improve the performance of the model right visualize the data if you really want to visualize that data in 2d 3d or 1d mode you can definitely use dimensionality reduction and the major aim is basically to understand the data now let's go ahead and discuss about feature selection okay so this feature selection is a process wherein it will help us to select the most important feature which will actually help us to predict the output okay now in order to understand the feature selection process uh, let's consider that i have a feature which is called as x and i have a feature that is called as y now let's say i have some data points over here something like this now with respect to this if i say when my x value is increasing my y value is increasing and if my x value is decreasing my y value is decreasing so here i can definitely say there is some kind of relationship right in this particular scenario that is when the x is increasing y is increasing and when the x is decreasing y is decreasing similarly i can have one more relationship wherein when my x is decreasing my y is increasing and when my x is increasing my y is decreasing right so this is also another relationship that i can have between x and y and in this particular case let's consider x is my input feature and y is my output feature right with respect to x i need to predict what is y now whenever i have this kind of relationship then here you'll be able to see if i plot with respect to x and y axis here you'll be able to see all the data points will be in a linear relationship right when it is in a really linear relationship then it will probably follow this particular approach where x is increasing y is increasing and x is decreasing y is increasing and that is true in this particular case when x is decrease increasing y is increasing right now similarly in this particular case if i probably want to draw a scatter plot my scatter plot will look something like this with respect to x and y right now if i probably try to see this all the points will be in this inverse relationship now whenever we have in this inverse re linear relationship then you will be able to see that it will follow this specific approach in this particular case it will follow this specific approach now obviously you know that when you have this kind of linear relationship then definitely x value will be very very helpful in finding out the y output and mathematically we can also find out a way to quantify this relationship and the technique that we specifically use in this is something called as covariance okay so here if i really want to find out the formula between covariance of x comma y the formula that is used is summation of i is equal to 1 to n x minus x bar multiplied by y minus y bar divided by and here i'll write x of i y of i divided by n minus 1 since we are doing it for sample data that is the reason we use n minus 1 now in this particular case let's say if we are going to get a positive value if it comes as a positive value that basically means we are going to follow this specific relationship 
if it comes as a negative value then we are going to follow this specific relationship so for this whenever we get negative we are going to follow this whenever you get positive we are going to follow this that basically means the relationship between x and y will have this kind of relationship that is the linear relationship when my covariance is positive when my when my covariance is negative it will follow inverse rel uh, linear relationship and along with that let's say if my covariance is approximately equal to zero that basically means there is no relationship between x and y no relationship no relationship between x and y no relationship between x and y so if i try to plot this in this kind of the scattered plot with respect to x and y i will be just getting a scattered plot which may be in circular way and here you can not definitely find out uh, the relationship between x and y that basically means when x is increasing whether y is increasing or not or whether y is increasing or y is decreasing whether x is increasing or not right so whichever have this kind of highly positive correlationship sorry covariance a highly positive relationship which we basically calculate through covariance we can definitely say that those features are super important features right so in this particular case i can definitely say that if i get a covariance as positive i can definitely say x is a super important feature and it will definitely be helpful in predicting y but if i get the covariance between x and y as zero i'll definitely say that there is no much relationship between x and y right so i can definitely remove this specific feature also right now let's understand along with covariance there is also a technique which is called as correlation and we basically say it has pearson correlation and pearson correlation can be given as a formula of covariance of x comma y multiplied by standard deviation of x multiplied by standard deviation of y now with the help of this your correlation will be ranging between minus 1 to plus 1 in this case there is no such range it can be any positive value it can be any negative value but with the help of pearson correlation coefficient you will be getting your value between minus 1 to plus 1 the more the value towards plus 1 now understand this is a super important point the more towards the value of plus 1 the more positive correlation it is the more positive correlated it is x and y is okay and the more the value towards minus 1 more negatively correlated it is right some same thing gets applied to minus 1 right more negative correlated it is and similarly if my correlation between x and y is near to 0 that basically means no relationship okay now this was an idea to talk about the relationship between x and y now how this particular process is basically used in feature selection this is just one of the technique guys there are other techniques also in feature selection but i just really want to give you a brief idea before we go ahead and understand pca okay let's say i have a specific data set and let's say this is my housing data set in this data set let's say i have features like house size the other feature that I have is something called as fountain size. Let's say that these houses are present within an apartment and we are also going to take this as a property to predict the price of the house. Now, in this case, these are my independent features. And this is my output or dependent feature. So that basically means I'm going to use this two independent feature to predict the output feature. And obviously when this value changes, this is also going to change. Now guys, if you just apply common sense, you know that fountain size may not be a very important feature because obviously even though you have a bigger fountain, a smaller fountain, it does not mean that your house, house price will increase within an apartments, right? Within a number of apartments, right? And obviously most of the bigger apartments, you know, a uh, group of apartments will definitely have some kind of fountain and all right just to showcase just to put some nice showcase this fountain is basically used right now if i go ahead and take each and every feature let's say let's say one of the feature i have taken house size and i have plotted along with the price house and let's say if i have found out this linear relationship definitely this indicates that this house size is an important parameter to determine the price because it has this linear relationship 
and how do you calculate the linear relationship or how do you quantify the relationship between house size and how price you can definitely use something like covariance and obviously you will either get a very high positive value or for some other use cases you may also get some negative co value some negative value okay or you can also apply correlation that basically means you'll be getting your value between minus one to plus one now in this particular case you definitely you can say house size is a important property and obviously important attribute and just by common sense also you can come to the conclusion now what about the feature that is if i try to plot this feature that is fountain size and probably price of the house now in this particular case let's say my plotting happens like this and let's say that this is not at all that much important right now here you can clearly see that there is no relationship between fountain size and price of the house you can see that or here you can definitely see that even though the fountain size is increasing the price of the house is stagnant almost in within this specific region right so definitely we can conclude come to a conclusion that the relationship between fountain size and price of the house will be very very less or it will be approximately equal to zero or let's say it is ranging between zero to 0.25 okay not bad not that positively or negatively correlated right so in this particular case what you can do is that you can consider that fountain size is not that important feature and you can drop this feature now this steps that we have performed we have basically we are basically saying this as a feature selection process and here you can also make sure that you can apply covariance and find out how a correlation and find out like what is the what is the relationship between this fountain size and price of the house so this is how you can come to a conclusion whether fountain size is important or not and based on that you can basically drop it right and this is what we usually do in the feature selection process we use correlation and covariance to do it okay now let's go ahead and discuss i hope everybody got an idea about feature selection now what we are going to do is that we are going to discuss about a important topic which is the next topic which is called as feature extraction now what does exactly happen in feature extraction in feature extraction let's say i have features like x1 x2 and let's let's consider the same housing example now let's say i have something like house size and let's say i have like number of rooms and finally i have something called as price of the house now in this particular case you want to reduce your number of features from two to one that is what we are doing right we are in dimensionality reduction let's say that i want to reduce my two features into one feature that is what we do now in this scenario you know that obviously or let's say instead of house size you know i will just write i'll just write room size okay room size now here i really want to perform some dimensionality reduction wherein from two features i want to convert this into one feature so obviously i cannot use feature selection why because both these features are super important in predicting the output that is your price both these features are super super important right this this are my independent feature and if i also try to find out the correlation or covariance between my input and the dependent feature here you'll be always be able to find out either very high positively correlated or high negatively correlated we'll be able to find that out and it is a common sense question guys this is obviously going to have a linear relationship with respect to this specific feature on the top we basically had fountain size and i just tried to show you an example by plotting it it did not have a much a linear correlation now in this particular case i obviously cannot drop one of the feature and just consider one feature because because here we can definitely see that there is some relationship between the independent and the dependent feature so in this case what do we do in this case we perform something called as feature extraction now in feature extraction the core idea is that we take this two independent feature we apply some transformation we apply some transformation to extract new feature and let's say this new feature is something called as house size i'm just giving as an example and my output feature is something called as price now instead of using this two feature that is room size and number of rooms 
if i also get to know the information of the house size then also i will be able to predict the price so in short from this two features i am trying to derive a new feature or extract a new feature which is called as house size now just imagine for a domain expert team if domain expert is given with this two fields room size and number of rooms he or she will definitely be able to predict or tell you the price now instead of giving these two features if we just give one feature to the domain expert then obviously he will also he or she will also be able to predict the price with some difference right with some difference obviously some amount of information is lost over here but again domain expert will also get a some clear idea about like with the help of house size also he or she can definitely predict the price so in feature extraction what we are doing is that we are trying to extract a new feature from the feature that is already present okay and this is how we basically reduce the number of features or dimensions okay usually here the example that i have taken only two independent feature but guys in a real world scenario you will be having 10 to 15 features and we will try to reduce it to two to three features okay now once i reduce this i will obviously be able to visualize it in a proper way i'll be able to see it and i'll be also able to understand the data now this is the idea behind feature selection versus feature extraction so in this video i've covered so many things uh, first of all why dimensionality reduction then why feature selection what is feature selection what is covariance what is pearson correlation there's also another correlation which is called as spearman rank correlation uh, then we have taken an example with respect to data set housing then i showed you that how we can go ahead with feature selection and how do we come up with feature extraction so guys now let's go ahead and discuss about the geometric intuition behind the principal component analysis now obviously you know that principal component analysis is used for dimensionality reduction right dimensionality reduction that basically means we are going to extract some features with respect to the older features that are present in the data set let's say i have features like size of the house and number of rooms and this is basically the price of the house which is my output feature right this is my output feature now here let's go ahead and probably plot it plot a data points between the size of the house and the price of the house so let's go ahead and plot some data points over here and let's say this is my size of the house and this is basically my number of rooms now let's say that i have some data points which looks like this right let's say i have some data points which looks clearly like this okay now in this particular case you can see that uh, from this you are able to find out when the size of the house increases the number of rooms are also basically increasing and obviously it is a common sense question it really needs to increase when the size of the house increases you can assume that yes the number of rooms is also going to increase now let's consider that with the help of pca okay i want to reduce this two dimension of features into one dimension okay into one dimension now if i want to perform this that basically means i just want to convert this two dimension into one dimension okay this is what i'm actually looking with the help of pca that basically means instead of having two independent features, i just need to have one independent feature and try to basically create that independent feature try to find out this one dimension or independent feature now in this particular scenario let's say that one way obviously i've already taught you right feature selection in feature selection what you can do you can take either one of the feature and you can ignore the other feature and a simple way of converting a two dimension into one dimension is that what i will do over here is that i will make sure that i will plot all this point in my x-axis let's say i'm just going to project all this point in my x-axis so here you will be able to see here i i'm getting the point here i'm getting the point here i'm getting the point right so once i do this you'll be able to see that i will be able to project all the points over here now when i project all the points obviously i'm able to get all my data points in one dimension so this data points that you'll be seeing we are able to get it in one dimension so here what i have done i have basically converted this into from 2d to 1d right and uh, one more thing with respect to this specific data points which is super important to understand in pca is that if i probably see the first data point and the last data point the area between this is basically my spread of the data points now if my spread is huge 
then what will happen my variance will also increase my variance will also increase if my spread is increasing my variance will also increase okay so this is both are directly proportional to each other now what is the disadvantage by using this approach where i'm directly projecting in my x axis so here obviously the size information is getting captured but the number of rooms information is getting lost so this information that you had related to number of rooms why this information is getting lost because understand over here if i try to project from here to the first point also right here also you have some amount of spread now as i said if the spread is increasing the variance is also increasing and over here because of this variance here also some information regarding number of rooms are there right and you are directly skipping this information you are neglecting this information when you use this specific approach right wherein you are directly projecting into one axis so here with this approach what is the major thing that is happening there is loss of information right and in this case you are losing the information about the number of rooms obviously you created you created from a two dimension you created a one dimension and this is this is our or all your one dimension points but from this when you convert it from this 2d to 1d you are losing much information from the number of rooms right about one specific feature now because of this what will happen you once you lose all this information you know your model may not perform well with respect to this specific uh, predictions of, uh, so here in short you are doing feature extraction but you are doing feature extraction with lot of information that are lost right so this in this feature ex extraction process you are losing lot amount of information right so i hope you have got this specific idea now you also have to take care when you do this kind of feature extraction this information need not be lost that much so how do you prevent it so in pca to give you a brief idea let me draw this particular diagram again let's say if this is my size and this is my number of rooms and let's say these are my data points over here let's say these are my data points over here now in pca what you do is that you do some kind of transformation on this axis on this x axis and y axis what kind of transformation you apply some mathematical equation uh i'll again not talk about that mathematical equation right now but uh, i'll just name it you apply something called as eigen decomposition eigen decomposition on some matrix on some matrix okay we'll discuss about this what exactly this is but in short you are going to apply some transformation and this is the specific transformation and with the help of this specific transformation you will be getting a new axis which will look like this let's say this will be a new axis which will look like this okay and once you get this specific axis what will happen is that then you will try to project this information over here you will try to project all this information over here now when you try to project this specific information okay now suppose since you have two features you will try to apply some transformation which will change this size axis to some other axis like size dash and one more axis will get created let's say uh, the other axis will be exactly perpendicular to this axis okay and this will be your number of rooms dash number of room dash and then you will be projecting all these points over here so when you project all these points over here here are your data points now in this projection and in this projection what are the differences in the previous projection and in this projection what are the differences now see in the x axis if i consider this as my new x axis here you'll be able to see that the spread is properly captured with respect to this specific points and similarly if i try to plot all this point on this new axis here you'll be able to see your spread that is going to get lost once we project over here will be very very less will be very very less so here what you are doing is that you are applying some transformation and you are creating a new axis like the size dash and number of room dash and once you create this new axis all you do is that you now just project all this point to this particular axis 
And after projecting this point, you can see that maximum variance is getting captured for all the points over here. So here, maximum variance is getting captured. Maximum variance is getting captured. And why this is better than this? Because in the y-axis, you're not losing much information. You're just losing this amount of information, right? This amount of variance you are basically losing, right? when you project it on the x-axis. Now with this transformation, you're able to convert your two dimension into one dimension. And you're making sure that much information is not lost. Much information is not lost. And how do you, how do you come up with this specific point? Because see in the y-axis, because of this new dimension here, the variance is less, right? So even though you project this point over here, most of the variance is basically getting captured by your x-axis. So much information is not lost. If you compare the previous example here, once you project it into the x-axis, huge amount of information is getting lost because here the variance is quite high or spread is quite high. Here it is not that high, right? So I hope you have understood our main aim in PCA is that to find out this kind of lines, right? So after transformation, which is the new axis that is basically getting created. Now, since I just had two dimensions, so after I do the transformation, I basically call this as principal component analysis one. So PCA one, principal component one, and we basically say this as principal component two. Suppose if you have three dimension, that basically means you will be having three principal components. Always remember PC1 will be capturing the maximum amount of variance and then PC2 will be capturing the next maximum amount of variance. Similarly, if you have three dimension, then PC3 will be capturing the maximum amount of variation after PC1, sorry, maximum amount of variance after PC1 and PC2, right? So over here in geometric intuition behind uh, PCA, our main aim is to basically find out principal components, right? Like how we find out this. And at the end of the day, we really need to find out one line that should be able to capture maximum amount of variance. And once we take this PC1, and then we can convert this into a, from a two dimension, we will just be taking up this specific point and it will finally get converted into a one dimension point, right? So I hope you got an idea about what is the geometric intuition behind PCA, uh, PCA, that is principal component analysis. We'll talk more about what is eigen decomposition on metrics and what is this specific transformation. Uh, with examples, I'll try to show you, but just understand that your main aim is to find out the principal component, which has, after projecting all the points, it should have captured the maximum variance or spread, okay? And why variance is important because variance basically talks about the data, how the data is basically spread. And with the help of variance, you'll be able to capture more and more information. So guys, the final goal of a PC algorithm will be that to find out the principal components uh, in such a way that maximum variance will be captured. So suppose if I have two dimension points, then I will basically be having PC1, then PC2, right? And we know that the variance with respect to PC1, after we, uh, you know, project all the points in that particular component will be greater than the variance with respect to the principal component two once we project it. Suppose if we have specifically three dimensions, then here you will be able to see that we will be getting three principal components. Okay. That basically means like uh, we'll be having three different axes. One is PC1, PC2, PC3. And obviously the variance with respect to PC1 will be greater than the variance with respect to PC2 after we project the points and the variance with greater than PC3, okay? So this variance will be following this specific approach. So let's say that if I have a task wherein I have two dimension points, which is like this, and let's say I want to convert this 2D to 1D, so at the end of the day, what I will be doing is that the PC algorithm uh, will be finding out the best 
principal component line it can be this 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 line you know and it will try to select the two best principal component lines principal component lines and how we say that this is the best principal components line because once we project let's say once we project this specific points on this line right we will be able to call this line as the best line only when the variance that is getting captured as maximum okay so let's say this line has actually captured the maximum variance so i will say this as pc1 suppose if this line has captured the second maximum variance then i will basically say it as pc2 so so this specific line will be my pc2 right and uh, at the end of the day if i'm converting this into 2d to 1d then what will happen i will basically be taking up all this specific points that i have actually plotted over here okay so guys the final goal will basically be to get the best principal component and how do we say that it is the best principal component which captures maximum variance right which captures maximum variance okay now let's say that if i want to convert a three dimension point to one dimension now in the case of three dimension points you know we will be getting three components one is pc1 pc2 and pc3 right and uh, obviously it can be all these three lines any of the best three lines and you know that the variance of pc1 will be greater than variance of pc2 and this will be greater than variance of pc3 so since i really want to convert this into one dimension what i will do i will project all the points in pc1 and i will be taking all these points as my one dimension point right one dimension point let's say if i want to convert this three dimension into two dimension then what i'll do i will probably take pc1 and i'll also make sure that i'll project all the points in pc2 and i'll take this two information and combine it together to basically get my two dimension right so this is what is the approach that we are going to follow again let me repeat it the major and the final aim of the principal uh, component analysis is to find the best line after the transformation which will be able to capture maximum variance and the line can be existing anywhere in this space right and with with respect to that based on the number of dimension that you want to convert you can take that many number of principal components okay so yes uh, in the next video we are going to see the mathematical intuition behind uh, how this transformation basically happens and that is where we are going to learn about eigen decomposition on a specific matrix we'll talk about all what are the steps and how do you project it we will also see that how do you project the specific point on the specific line and how do we make sure that the variance will be maximum uh, we'll be discussing about that okay so guys now let's go ahead and understand the maths intuition behind the pc algorithm now over here let's consider that i have this two axes x and y and i have just plotted this point and let's consider that my aim is to convert or reduce from two dimensions to one dimension and as you know the final goal of the pc algorithm is to find out the best principal component line after the transformation from this axis in such a way that maximum variance needs to be get captured now let's say for this example i am just going to consider this is that specific line which is my principal component one because as soon as i plot all this point over here you can see that maximum variance will get captured right so that is the reason why we are selecting this as the best principal component line okay now what pca is actually going to do in order to come to this conclusion like whether this is the best or not there are two important things one is projections and the second thing is the cost function that is related to the variance okay so let's go ahead and discuss about both of them okay so out of all these points let's do one thing let's take up one point and for now i can just consider this is my point p1 okay which is denoted by x and x1 y1 okay this is obviously denoted by x1 y1 because why this is my x axis this is my y axis so let's say this is denoted by x1 comma y1 okay so i can consider i can consider also this p as a vector okay so let's say that this is a specific vector and uh, this p1 is a vector 
And let's consider that we also have a unit vector, which is specifically given as u. Okay, so this is my unit vector. Now, the first point, let's go to the first point. The first point is all about projection. So let's say that if we really want to project this P1 into this particular point, okay, into this particular vector, then we will get something called as P1 dash. Now, we really need to find out what is this new projection because see over here, our main aim is to capture the maximum variance. The maximum variance will only get captured when all the other points that you will be seeing in this, right? Once we do the projection over here, once we do the specific projection over here, over here, over here, over here, then only we'll be able to take up all this point and calculate the maximum variance or we will be able to calculate the variance, right? So that is the reason why we really need to project this particular point over here. So once we project, let's say if you are trying to project P1 to P1, uh, to this particular unit vector that is U, P1 dash, then this projection is given by an equation. Let's say if I'm saying projection of uh, P1 on U, right? If we write the specific equation, the equation will be given something like by, we can write it as P1, that is magnitude of P1, sorry, uh, P1 vector multiplied by U vector divided by magnitude of u okay so this is the equation that is basically used with respect to the projection of a specific vector on a unit vector okay and since this magnitude of u is equal to one since this is a unit vector and whenever we have a unit vector the magnitude of that particular vector will be one we can write the projection of p1 on u is equal to nothing but dot product of P1 multiplied by U. So this is the entire thing that we basically get. So as soon as I do a dot product of P1, which is given by this coordinate X1 and Y1, and let's say this unit vector is given by the coordinate X2, Y2. When we do the dot product with respect to P1 and U, I'm actually going to get P1 dash. Okay, so this is nothing but this is P1 dash. Now, this is with respect to the projection, which everybody needs to understand, okay? Now, uh, let's go towards understanding like this, when we do all the projection, let's say once we project P1, we will be getting P1 dash. Let's say there will be another point. Let's say this is P2, then we'll be getting P2 dash, then we'll get P3 dash, then we'll get P4 dash, right? All the points, we will finally project it. Let's say P, P0 dash. Like this, we have more, all the points and we get finally P and dash. Now, once we have all these points and remember, whatever value we get from this particular dot product, it is a scalar value, right? And when we can take up all the scalar values, so this all values that we are going to get after projecting it, this all will be a scalar value itself, right? Scalar value itself. Now, once we have all these values, these values are basically talking about the distance. Let's say, what is P1 dash basically talking about? It is just talking about the distance from here to this particular axis, right? So let's say if I'm probably calculating distance from origin to this, right? It is basically talking about this specific distance, right? P1 dash. Similarly, P2 dash, suppose if this is P2 dash, I'm basically talking about this distance, right? From here to P2 dash. Now, once I have the scalar values, then it becomes easy for me to compute the variance, right? Let's say, uh, these are all my points. So I'm just going to select all these things, okay? And uh, these are my points, P0 dash, P1 dash, P2 dash, P3 dash. So let's say I'm talking about the specific points. Uh, let me give us some different notation so that it becomes easy for you to understand. So let's say this is X0 dash, X1 dash, x2 dash, x3 dash, x4 dash, like this I have xn dash, okay? Now in order to compute the variance, I can simply use an equation that is summation of i is equal to one to n. And here I will specifically be using, how do you calculate variance? You will be able to take x of i minus x of i, oh sorry, this will be x bar, uh, which will be the mean of x whole square divided by n. So if you use this equation, you will be able to calculate the variance and understand here, your main aim will be to, your, your main aim will be to find out the unit vector, the best unit vector, which has the maximum variance. Your goal is basically to find the best unit vector, best unit vector. And how do we say best? Because it captures 
which captures maximum variance maximum variance so this is the example with respect to this what we have actually discussed here at the end of the day we are trying to capture or we are trying to find out the vector which captures the maximum variance right so this basically becomes our cost function this become our cost function so here i'm just going to write max of variance we have to do we have to find the max of variance so in short we have to find the best unit vector which captures the maximum variance right so this is in short an understanding where you are taking care of two things one is projection and one is the cost function wherein you are focusing more on getting the maximum variance right now we will try to understand now see obviously we cannot keep on go ahead and selecting uh, different different units vectors and probably trying to find out the best vector in that way so what happens is that there is a technique which is called as eigen decomposition which we specifically say as eigen vectors and eigen values suppose okay this eigen vectors and eigen values because our main aim is an, as said right we really need to find out the unit vector right whether the unit vector should be this this or this or this or this right so how do i find out which unit vector we should basically select to capture the maximum variance so for that we will be using something called as eigen vectors and eigen values and there are some steps right that are steps which are involved in this first of all the first step will be that i really need to find out the covariance matrix between features between features and in order to find out eigenvectors and eigenvalues what i need to do is that uh, we this eigenvectors and eigenvalues will be eigenvectors and eigenvalues will be computed or will be found out from this covariance matrix how that we'll discuss about it don't worry and whichever eigenvector will be the largest one when we say the eigenvector which is largest one that basically means uh, for the eigenvector where the eigenvalue is high this eigenvalue basically talks about the magnitude of the eigenvector okay so this eigenvalue is nothing but this is basically the magnitude of the eigenvector this will basically capture the maximum variance capture the maximum variance and this is mathematically proved guys i will not be proving you this thing but uh, here according to linear algebra and with some of the mathematical equation we can definitely prove this so in order to why do we compute eigen vectors and eigen values because see at the end of the day i really need to find out the best unit vector such that maximum variance is captured and we cannot keep on hit doing hit and trial right so what we do is that in order to find out we really need to go ahead and find out eigen values and eigen vectors sorry eigen vectors and eigen values and the step is that first of all we will go ahead and find out the covariance matrix between the features okay between the features we'll go ahead and find out the covariance matrix and then we'll try to find out the eigen vectors and eigen values uh, the eigen vectors and eigen values can be found out by the simple equation that is a lambda is equal to uh, sorry a vector v is equal to lambda vector v we'll try to understand this specific equation what exactly this equation is this is nothing but linear transformation of matrix of matrix so we'll try to understand what exactly is this linear transformation of matrix uh, and then once we do this you will be able to get some eigen values whichever eigen vector has the a highest eigen value which is nothing but magnitude of the eigen vector that specific vector will get selected if suppose this is the vector that has the highest magnitude then this will get selected because uh, mathematically it is proven that whenever we project on this specific line maximum variance will get captured okay so this is what we are going to do in the next step we'll understand about eigen values eigen vector eigen decomposition from a specific matrix in this video we are going to discuss about eigen vectors and eigen values now already in my previous video i have spoken about it what eigen vectors and eigen values can actually do see at the end of the day we have to find the best principal component line 
which will be able to capture maximum variance. And in order to find this, we will be using this eigenvectors and eigenvalues because in short, whichever eigenvector, like if suppose, let's, let's consider that we have, uh, we have some data points, let's say I have some data points over here. And this data points, let's say I want to find out the best principal component line in such a way that once we make sure we project this right in this, right in this particular line we should be able to capture the maximum variance. Now, what is so amazing about this eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and we'll also be talking about linear transformation, okay? And we also say it as eigen decomposition of covariance matrix. That basically means for this particular matrix, we will try to find out the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, okay? Now, now the most important thing about these vectors is that Suppose let's say I have a specific matrix, okay, I can have any specific matrix on this matrix <clears throat> or if I have a vector, let's say the vector is V, okay, and this vector will have a different coordinates, let's say, if this vector, on this particular vector, let's say if I apply some linear transformation, okay, what does this linear transformation basically mean? I'll give you an example that basically means on this particular vector, let's say if I apply a linear transformation with this specific matrix, then I will be getting one lambda value and this lambda is nothing but my eigenvalue multiplied by the same vector. So here you can see that this basically means that suppose I have a vector with this particular dot on top of this, if I apply linear transformation, what does linear transformation basically mean? Let's say I have my coordinate system and right now it is in this grid manner. Okay, let's say this is entirely all my data is in this grid manner, right? When I say linear transformation, you know, this entire data can be moved or this entire plane can be moved in different, different direction. Okay, I'll, I'll just show you one, one example directly. So, Always understand in order to compute the eigen values and vectors. So what we do is that let's say if A is my matrix, okay, on top of it, if I apply this matrix uh, on, on the top of this specific vector, like if I apply the linear transformation on top of this specific vector, then I will be getting lambda, which is my eigen value along with that same vector. So this is the equation that I will specifically be using in order to find out eigen values and eigen vectors. Okay. And from this equation, whichever eigenvector, eigenvector has the biggest magnitude or has the maximum magnitude, because for a space, for a matrix, I can definitely have multiple vectors, okay? So from this, whichever has the maximum magnitude, that will be used as a plane or principal component because it is practically proved through maths. Again, I'm not going to go towards that particular proof, but this principal component will be able to capture maximum variance. Okay. So let me go ahead and show you one example. Okay. So here I will just show you one example. So this is a linear transformation. Let's say I have one vector over here. Okay. I have one vector. So this vector is nothing but one comma one, right? So here I hope everybody is able to see this. Okay. One comma one. So this is my vector. Now on this particular vector, if I apply a linear transformation with this matrix, okay, with this matrix, now what will happen you see, because once we do the linear transformation, this particular line will now get changed and it will display something like this. See, after I apply this transformation, my new points that I'm going to get is something like four, four, two, right? Now four, two is nothing but here you can see the lambda value will be four comma two because one one zero one zero one point zero one one point zero is my vector, right? So here also you'll be able to see I can multiply lambda multiplied by this particular number. So here you can see four comma two. That basically means for a vector, if I apply a linear transformation with this particular matrix, I'm going to get a lambda value with four and two as its lambda uh, the, as its eigen value. Now. Let me just show you the eigenvectors also. Let's say here I've checked on eigenvectors and let me also show the snap grid. Okay. So here you'll be able to see what is basically happening. This line that you see, right? This is basically my vector. Okay. Now here you can see for this particular point, when I apply this transformation, the vector is in another direction and this is in another direction. 
right now let's say my initial point was somewhere here let's say my initial point was somewhere here and if i probably apply the same operation now it is minus one zero right then what will happen is that you can see the new transformation right i'm actually getting minus two comma two and here you can see this is in the direction of the vector so what i can do is that i can project this particular point into this plane right so here this will be my longest vector with this longest magnitude okay just for an example i'm considering like that if i keep on doing another another points right if i keep on doing let's say i'm i'm putting it over here right and if i go back here you'll be able to see this was my initial vector now after applying linear transformation it has gone outside the plane similarly i can and this time vector did not match suppose if i have this point over here and if i try to apply it here you can see again uh, this will get transformed to different different values so your lambda value will keep on getting changed based on the different different vectors okay so from this i can we, we can definitely see that what is happening is that from this specific equation we will be able to get the eigen vectors and this eigen vector which has the maximum magnitude when i say maximum magnitude that basically means the max eigen values that will be selected as the best principal component line okay in this particular case it is pc1 because it captures maximum variance okay so at the end of the day you'll be able to see with the help of this eigen vectors and eigen values you'll be able to see this okay and the same thing is happening now let's go ahead and understand the steps to calculate eigen values steps to calculate eigen values and eigen vectors value and eigen vector because as i said that you require a matrix right in this specific case we have to calculate the covariance of the features right now let's say if your features were x comma y your independent feature and this is your z as your output feature so for this i want to extract another feature which will can be x dash so what i will do is that i will try to find out the covariance of x comma y so let me write down the equation of covariance of x comma y so here you can see that i will be able to write summation of i is equal to 1 to n x of i minus x bar multiplied by y of i minus y bar divided by n minus 1 okay now here you can definitely see that uh, if i really want to find out the covariance of x comma y usually we get two cross two matrix okay now this specific matrix looks something like this okay let's say i'm just going to divide like this so this will be a two cross two, two matrix this will be x this will be y this will be x this will be y so if i try to find out the covariance of x comma x then what it will become so if i try to find out the covariance of x comma x here you will be able to see i will i can also write this as variance of x why because x comma x basically means x of i minus x uh, bar right so x of i minus x bar it will be nothing but x of i minus x bar whole square which is nothing but variance of x right so here you will be able to see that i will write variance of x here this will be covariance of x comma y here it will be covariance of uh, y comma x and here it will be uh, variance of y okay because covariance of y comma y is nothing but variance of y right now this is the first step we have to compute this specific matrix and this is for a two cross two matrix if suppose if i have three independent feature x y z then i have to probably create three input three cross three matrix right i have to basically create like this three cross three matrix now here you'll be able to see that i will be creating this kind of lines and here will be one here will be another right now again here all in the in the diagonal element it will be the variance of x variance of y variance of z and remaining all you will be able to see this and one more thing that variance of covariance of x comma y is equal to covariance of y comma x this both will be equal right now what we are going to do in order to find out the eigen values we will take up this covariance matrix this let's consider it is a and we will try to take a vector v and this a will be taken which will be my covariance matrix and i will try to apply a transformation of the vector and finally we will be getting lambda lambda over here and this vector will be given back 
Now, since I have two features over here, F1 and F2, let's say, then I will be getting two lambda one values, right? Lambda one and lambda two. Lambda one will basically be giving my principal component line one magnitude. And whereas my lambda two will be giving me the principal component two magnitude, right? So this will be PC one, right? So like this, when you have three features, you are going to get all lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, which will specifically talk about the eigenvalues. So just by using this equation, at the end of the day, you will be getting an eigenvector and that eigenvector will be giving you two or three based on the number of features that you have that many lambda values. Let's say if it is giving lambda one and lambda two, that basically means you have two eigenvalues and whichever eigenvalue is the highest over here that will be and it will already give that in that specific value in like uh, the lambda one will be the highest and lambda two will be the highest so this way you'll be able to get this uh, lambda one and lambda two which are specifically the eigenvalues and then this can be considered as pc1 and this can be considered as pc2 so guys just to revise all the steps now uh, what we are going to do is that let's consider the first step over here so i'm going to write it down uh, the first step uh, that again we are going to do, let's say that I have my data points over here. So let's say this is my X and Y. And uh, let's say I want to probably first of all convert this into 2D from 1, from 1D to sorry from 2D to 1D. Then the first step that I am actually going to do is basically standardize this data. Now once I standardize this data, what will happen is that all these data points that you will be seeing, it will be zero centered, you know. So here you will be able to see all the data points like this. Okay, let's say these are my data points that have got zero centered. After this, uh, the second step is that we go ahead and find out the covariance matrix of this X and Y. Okay, let's say this is my X and Y. So we basically find out the covariance matrix. And again, in the case of two independent features, uh, two independent features, I'll be getting a two cross two matrix, right? So this will basically be my two cross two matrix with respect to X and Y, X and Y. Here I'm going to get the variance of X. And here I'm basically going to get um, covariance of X comma Y. And here I'll be getting covariance of Y comma X. And finally, I'll be getting variance of Y, right? Now, after I get this covariance matrix, all I have to do is that find out find out eigen vectors and values vectors and values and how do i find it out by just applying let's say this is my matrix a so this a when we apply a transformation on vector v i'm going to get this eigen value of v right now since this is a two cross two matrix here i'm going to get lambda one and lambda two okay so this two values are my eigen values and eigen values okay and this uh this lambda one will basically be indicating me by pc1 that is principal component one line and this will be my pc2 line so in short after this particular points what we are going to do is that let's say that we will be creating two different line one line may be this one line may be this or let me just draw it in different color so let's say this may be my PC one. Okay, so this may be my PC one. And this may be my PC two. Okay. But as we know that the first lambda one value, which I'm getting, which is nothing but the magnitude of the eigenvector magnitude of the eigenvector. Here it will capture the maximum variance. So this variance that is getting captured will be maximum. So we go ahead and select this. Now, let's say if I want to convert from a three dimension to one dimension, then what will happen? I will get three lambda uh, values, that is three eigenvalues. Now what I can do, I can combine this to lambda one and lambda two and probably take, okay, or uh, since I, I have already explained you, this lambda one is nothing but PC one, this is PC two and this is PC three, right? So I can combine PC one and PC two uh, and convert this two dimension into 1D. And then this can also be taken as another 1D. So when I combine this two, right, it becomes a 2D, right? 
So if I probably want to convert from 3D to 2D, I'll be going in this way. So let's say if I want to convert from 3D to 1D. So once I find out my eigenvalue and vectors, I'll be getting lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. I have to combine all these three and probably get one dimension in this case. Similarly, in the case of 2D to 1D. So let's say if I want to convert from 2D to 1D, here I'll be getting lambda 1 and lambda 2. This is nothing but my PC1. This is nothing but my PC2. So we can combine this two both and we can get a one dimension point, right? When I say combining, that basically means I'm talking about projection. Once I project all the point, I will be able to get that specific dimension. So uh, I hope you have got an idea, but these are the steps that we basically follow in order to find out the projection. But at the end of the day, you know, you are trying to find out you are trying to find out with respect to any data points, you are trying to find out the best principal component line that can fit on this data such that it captures maximum variance. Now, like in this case, this can be, or in this case, this can be, right? So this can be my PC1, this can be my PC2. Why I'm saying this? Because maximum variance is captured. See, maximum variance is getting captured, right? So this was the idea behind principal component analysis. I hope you have understood the maths behind it. If not, I would suggest please revise it. I've written around nine pages just to make you explain about principal component analysis. Hello all. So guys, in this video, we're going to implement the principal component analysis implementation where we'll focus on doing dimensionality reduction or we can also say feature extraction. We'll try to see that how we can implement this with the help of sklearn and Python. So to begin with, what I'm actually going to do quickly is that import some of the libraries like import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, okay, import seaborn as sns, import uh, numpy as np, and I can also import pandas as pd. Along with this, I'm just going to say matplotlib inline, right? So all these things, we are basically going to import it. Now, what we are actually going to do is that we are going to, first of all, uh, load our data set. So load the data set and the data set that we are going to play is with a breast cancer data set. So over here, you'll be seeing from sklearn dot uh, data sets, if I write, we'll be able to import load breast cancer. So here it is. And what we are going to do is that with the help of this specific data set, we are just going to I'm just going to write something like cancer underscore data set is equal to load breast cancer. Okay, and here we go and import it. Now, finally, if you probably go and see my cancer data set dot keys, you'll be able to see various keys like data, target, frame, target names, and all. So, over here, uh, and if I probably just uh, go ahead and probably print cancer underscore data set dot decr if i probably print this you'll be able to see this entire information how your data set looks like okay so here is how your data set looks like you can see this you have features like radius texture perimeter area smoothness compactness concativity concave point symmetry fractal dimension and your class is basically malignant and benign uh, this is your output feature and with respect to this, you have so many number of records that are having malignant as our output and 357 records that has benign as the output. Now, in the next step, what we are going to do quickly is that I'm just going to create a simple data frame. So here I'll just go to write DF is equal to PD dot data frame. And here, first of all, I'm just going to use my cancer data set. And here I'm just going to take all my data because that data key has the entire data over here. And you can definitely check out over here itself, right? Uh, with respect to all the attributes, you'll be able to see something like data key over here. So this data key that you are able to see, right? It will basically be having that. So here cancer uh, of cancer underscore data of, uh, of data, you'll be able to get that. And the columns that I'm basically going to take is nothing but my feature names. Okay, so here is my df dot head, right? So these are all my features that are there with respect to all this. 
Uh, now what I'm going to do is that I'm not going to just uh, solve some classification or regression problem statement. Principal component is more about dimensionality reduction. Now let's say if I have probably 10 to 11 features and obviously I cannot visualize this. I have to basically convert this into 2D or 3D, true dimension or three dimension and then probably we'll be able to visualize it. But here our focus is not to remove the features, but we, we are going to extract some features, making sure that some of the variance is basically getting captured. And again, whatever theoretical, theoretical concept we have learned in principal component analysis, uh, we will try just try to take all these features and try to extract only two features that captures the maximum amount of information out of it. Okay, now uh, to do this, uh, what I am going to do, first of all, I'm just going to apply standardization. This is a good step to do in feature scaling also. Sorry, in in PCA, we have to definitely do feature scaling. And for that, we are going to use standard scalar. So I'm going to write from sklearn dot preprocessing import standard scalar. And here I'm basically going to write scalar is equal to standard scalar, right? And once I execute this, all I have to do just write scalar.fit on my entire DF, right? So once I do this or once I execute this, that basically means my entire fit has actually happened on the scale data frame. And then I can transform this entire data frame based on the standard scaling. And I'll try to save it in a variable which is called a scaled data. Okay. So here, in order to perform the transformation, I'll just write scalar.transform. Okay. And here you'll be able to see DS. And finally, you'll be able to see my scaled data in the form of uh, standardization. It is basically in the standardization. That basically means the mean is zero and your standard deviation is one. So most of your data will be ranging between minus three to plus three, right? So that is how this entire standardization process have actually taken place. Now, what we are going to do is that out of all these particular features, we are just going to extract two features. So in order to do that, what we can do is that we can apply PCA. So here I'm just going to write applying PCA algorithm. Okay. And for, to, for applying the PCA algorithm here, I'm just going to use from sklearn dot decomposition. I'm going to just import PCA and I'm just going to execute it. And here we'll be writing PCA is equal to principal component analysis. And here by default, if you probably go and see, I have to give this value, which is called as n underscore components. Right now, let's say if I have this many number of features, I want to convert this into two features. I want to extract two features out of it, which captures maximum variance. So all I have to do is that just go ahead and write this n underscore component as two. Okay. So once I probably do this uh, and probably execute it, then all I have to do is that I just write PCA dot fit underscore transform on my data that data specifically is the entire scale data so i'm just going to give my scale data over here okay and probably once i transform this particular data and if i write this is my uh, data underscore pca now here's you can see that once i execute this code what will happen is that my data underscore pca will just have two columns now one column and two column why we have to basically converted this into two columns so that we will be able to visualize it that basically means out of all these columns that we specifically had right now what has happened is that after applying pca you know this has transformed the entire data into two columns right so two feature columns we have able to get it and it is converted in such a way that maximum variance is basically getting captured and again for that you have eigen decomposition concepts which we have well discussed in the theory part okay so now here you'll be able to see that we are able to capture this two features or we are able to extract two features out of that entire two uh, and this process is basically called that dimensionality reduction okay now if i probably go ahead and write pca dot let's see there is one more important function i just need to show you to you um let me just have a look explained variance right so once i execute this here you'll be able to see this is the explained variance of feature one and feature two you know and probably if i if i don't exactly use n underscore component is equal to two so here why two explained variance it is saying that because from this two feature this much variance is being able to get captured right and now here if you probably uh, 
you know, if I probably take this up and apply the PCA without giving n underscore components, right? So, so let's say if I probably just give over here and I don't give my x underscore components, right? Oops, let me just write, okay? And probably then if I write PCA dot fit underscore transform on my data and that data, let's say is scale data, then what I'm actually going to do, it is just going to create that many number of components, how many number of features were there? right now if i probably go and search for pca dot explained variance so here you'll be able to see with respect to every feature how much variance is basically getting captured right and probably if we, if i try to add this up we will be getting some value that is near to 100 okay so here you can clearly see this many number of features are so that many number of explained variants are there now you know that what we have done is that we have basically applied n risk component is equal to 2 and once i do this i'm getting two features as my extracted and if i probably see my explained variance this is how much it is getting captured okay so i'm just going to remove this since we need to just uh, focus on two uh, two variables or two features right now we will try to see that with the help of these two features will we be able to do something right will we be able to do something uh, so the best way is that we'll try to see it in the most visualized format so yeah i'm copying a code where it is written as plot dot figure and uh, here you can see data underscore pca i'm just going to use data underscore pc over here data underscore pc over here. so this is for my first feature and this is for my first feature uh, sorry zeroth feature zeroth feature over here and this is my first feature i'm just trying to plot it in the scatter diagram and over here what i have actually done is that we are going to also take the target column. Now this target column here, you'll be able to see that where our target column basically exists in this, right? So cancer underscore data of target, if I probably write, we'll be able to get the, all the target values over there. And then the type of mapping we are going to use is something called as plasma. My X level will basically talk about first principal component and second principal component. Always understand the first principal component will have maximum variance captured when compared to the second one. Then as we go with respect to the third one, again, the variance will get reduced. Okay. So once I probably execute it here, you can see that how clearly the, my data points is visible. And even for this particular problem statement, I can probably solve it with the help of any classification problem statement. But here you can definitely see that out of all the 11 to 12 features, we have easily converted this into two features. And now it was able to capture maximum amount of information. So that is the reason my data points is clearly separable. And this was all about principal component analysis and how can you can implement it. Probably if you wanted three components, you could just need to write three components over here, right? And let me just show you that will also give you an idea. Like, see, when I wrote n underscore component is equal to three, I got three features. Now, if I probably go and write explained underscore variance, I'll be getting three values. This is PCA one, this is PCA two, and this is PCA three. PC one, PC two, PC three, right? And here you can see that this variance is getting decreased, right? So PC1 will be having the maximum number of variants that will be able to capture out of this, right? But now here just to for the displaying purpose, you can also do it for the three dimension. I'll just keep it like this and this is how it basically looks at, okay? So you can definitely uh, try out your own examples. You can take up a data set and try to convert it into two features, one feature, three features, as many you actually like, right? So this was a perfect example with respect to principal component analysis. Two things we have learned over here is that how we can perform dimensional data reduction and along with that how we are also able to understand that how much variance it is able to capture right so yes uh, this was it from my side i hope you like this particular video i'll see you all in the next video have a great day thank you and all bye bye